Hey, thanks for joining us for this episode. Today, we're joined by Corey Pinniger. We're going to be speaking about how to incorporate a virtual team into your practice on the Myopia Podcast. Welcome to the Myopia Podcast, where we give you the latest myopia research, clinical topics, and industry insights. Make sure to subscribe to stay up to date on all awesome myopia content. And now to our host, a massive myopia manager himself, Dr. David Kading. Hey friends, Dave Kading. Uh, before we get into the show, I wanted to mention that Team has supported this particular podcast and I'm really grateful for them reaching out to us and they mentioned that they would like to give uh, members of the Myopia Podcast community a $250 discount off of their first virtual assistant. If you have not considered uh, bringing in a virtual team, uh, I can attest to how wonderful it is. Over the last two years, we've brought in uh, about 10 team members onto our uh, practice. We've used different staffing services and we've had issues over the years with our staff not getting paid, having issues here or there, issues with the communication. And that has been really taken care of since we've joined up with team and their, uh, their group of virtual people. Uh, it's been fantastic and I would highly recommend that you consider doing it for your office. They can do things by answer the phone for you. They can uh, check uh, insurances. They can give patients calls. They can check on uh, scribing for you in the exam room and do a host of different things. Particularly in the myopia community, it's great to have somebody that can be in charge of these sort of things, checking on those myopic patients, seeing how they're doing, giving them a care call after they've had orthokeratology for a day, uh, and just kind of be a right hand to you in the exam room or to your billing team or your front desk. Consider higher team.com, H-I-R-E-T-E-E-M.com, or click the show notes to get the $250 discount when you sign up. Now back to the show. Thanks again for joining us. I am excited to have uh, my friend of uh, probably, what are we, about six, eight months here, buddy, uh, Corey Pinniger on, and Corey is with Team. Uh, some of you may uh, have, have worked with Corey in the past. He used to be with Weave years ago, um, but it's awesome to have you on, man. Uh, tell us a little bit about you. Where do you live? And uh, um, some of your history in eye care. You've done stuff in, in the eye care dental space for a long time. So give us a little history. Yeah. Well, first of all, it's an absolute pleasure uh, to be here today. This is a, a very fun part of my job. So I'm just grateful for the opportunity. Um, I'm Corey Pinniger. I'm probably terrible at the self-explanation part of this. Uh, <laughs> currently live in Salt Lake City, Utah, uh, born in the East Coast of the United States to a uh, large, uh, like entrepreneurial, but more corporate father. I, I definitely got the entrepreneurial genes where he got the uh, corporate America genes and uh, grew up with an itch to always build a business. Um, was a really early employee at Weave which was a hell of a time, even though the phones didn't work half of the time. <laughs> and uh, in December of 2016, I got the opportunity of a lifetime where the co-founders of Weave, Brandon and Jared Rodman, approached me and my business partner, Casey Henson, and said, hey, we've got this small department called Recall Solutions at Weave. We need to, we're currently you know, going to lay off about 40% of the company and this department just needs to go. And, you know, it's doing a quarter million dollars of business at the time. It's, it's probably profitable if you uh, shook the tree enough and uh, we just need to get rid of it. So if you guys are interested, we will sell it to you for a dollar. Wow. <laughs> and uh, I, at the time was going to BYU studying economics to uh, be like my father someday. And, had a uh, job offer to go into investment banking in, in corporate America. And I, I called my dad and I deeply love and respect my dad. He's the person I, I look up to most in the planet earth. And I was like, dad, listen to this awesome opportunity. I can buy part of weave for a dollar. And I told them what the business does. And there's silence on the other end of the line. And he goes, this is the dumbest idea I have ever heard of. And uh, since December of 2016, I've been working to prove him wrong. <laughs> 
So, so there's been iterations, obviously, of this. And I think you had told me that during COVID, the business had to completely change. So what was happening before? And then what has taken it virtual? Yeah, this is an awesome question. Um, so the business that we bought from Weave is not team today, to be clear. I own another mm -hmm. company called Reach. Right. <laughs> and um, it started out purely focused for dental practices. It's still focused for dentists today. And uh, have three main services, insurance verification, call answering, which both have great relevancy for optometry, and then overdue hygiene recare calls is the bread and butter of where it started. And uh, during COVID, we had a ginormous office in Lehigh, very close to where Weave's corporate headquarters was, and hundreds of team members. And as we all know on this call, um, getting staff members to stick became increasingly hard. Wages went through the roof. We, I think during that time, increased our wages over 50% in an 18-month period, and wow. everyone wanted to work from home. Yeah, And so we were sitting in an executive meeting every day or once a week. And, you know, for us to stay even as a business back then, we were hiring 15 to 25 people every month to train them for our call center to keep the same number of staff. That's how high our turnover was during COVID. Yeah. And you can't deliver quality to your customers when your staff is turning over quicker than you can even get new people in. Yep. So we we're talking about how do we solve the problem, but also at the same time, we can't go post a job for $35 an hour because we couldn't pass those enormous costs along to our customers. So someone came up with the idea that, hey, you know, I've heard there's a program through Brigham Young University called BYU Pathways, and that there's people in Latin America who have been educated at BYU, speak fluent English, are integrated generally into American cultural ways. And the idea was, hey, let's go hire a small batch of them or a small team and let's integrate them into one of our next hiring classes and let's prove that this would be lower cost. But more importantly, do these team members stick around for years to come? And I'll be candid that I was the biggest hater of the idea in the room. I I think all of us have had those experiences calling Bank of America or Wells Fargo or whoever it may be, where you go to another part of the globe, there's a very thick accent and there's someone reading a script who can't help you during your moment of need. And because of those experiences, I had developed a very negative taste to hiring virtual or international team members. But we also had no solution within the United States at the time. So begrudgingly, I said, let's go hire two of them and uh, let's see where it takes us. And um, over two and a half years later, I can look back and say it's the best damn decision we ever made. Those are some of the hardest working. And those two original hires that we made at Reach are still with us today. Hmm. Yeah. They're some of the hardest working, most humble people the customer satisfaction scores on them, even compared to our US team, is actually higher because this is a career. This is not a job to them. Right. And uh, that was really my welcoming into the world of talented international work. And I, what I love about this story is you were not going uh, outside the United States in an effort to save money. You were going outside the United States in an effort to find people who maybe would stay longer because you were losing at such a high rate. Your turnover, as I think we've all seen, was happening during that time period. And, you know, I not to spill the beans, but I've been, a, you know, hiring virtual people for a long time. And that has been a huge component of it is that we, we, we have a hard time finding an applicant pool for in office people. And, uh, they're not necessarily staying for a long period of time. If we get people to stay for two years, that's huge, right? Um, we've got a handful of people that have been with us for five or six years, but by and large, we're turning over those people. And some of them are going to optometry school. They're going out to do it. But to your point, it's not a career for them where you're pointing out that these people who uh, you're hiring from Latin America, this is like, this is it for them. This is like a, like a major career 
uh, path for them. Do you have any idea how many people at Reach you have that are now virtual? The vast majority of our staff. Wow. We, besides senior project manager level roles and above, um, we solely hire internationally. We never yeah. let go of our um, U.S. staff just as there was natural attrition or natural growth to the business um, in those frontline positions yeah. uh, continue to hire. And I mean, even our finance department today is entirely international. Mm -hmm. um, our IT department's entirely international. So it's just not the call center or scheduling or insurance verification roles. Um, but there's certain roles that we've provide. We found people with immense skill and dedication that we couldn't even find in the U S yeah. and uh, have yeah. built out our teams around that. So you've got a company that has been utilizing a virtual team to operate on anything that can be done virtually. And then you had this idea, Hey, I wonder if we can share this with, with offices. And this is how you came to team, I presume. It, so it actually started, it was December of 21. So two years ago on the dot, I had a friend who was working in the medical space call me and she had just won a contract with the U S government to read COVID tests as you went into remote facilities. So there was certain secure facilities that you, the U S and large corporations had where basically you had to take a live COVID test, a proctored COVID test, oh, and sure. then they would open the doors to the facility. And uh, she had just won a large agreement. And she's like, hey, um, could you, with your U.S. call center, hire 20 or 30 people that would just sit on camera all day long? And as people approached facilities, buzz them in. And I was like, to be honest, we don't even hire in the United States anymore. And uh, this is what we currently do. And that was our first agreement. So it wasn't even hmm. in optometry to start. It was just hey, there's businesses all across the world who need people. Yeah. And as you know, people asked certain questions, I said, hey, I can help you find people here. And that was our first couple hundred hires. Mm. Now, the interesting part about that is we had great growth, multi-million dollar growth within our first year, but it was so sporadic. Our growth was based on my phone ringing and someone asking us a question or asking me a question or a referral. So as we began to look at, okay, this is not just a random side hustle that it started as, it's something legitimate. We looked at certain verticals that we felt there was a lack of competition or a viable solution in, and that we had good relationships where we could go to market. So Peter Thiel, who started PayPal, who I, I think is a brilliant mind, says you want to pick a niche and you want to monopolize it. And so we started to look statistically at areas where we felt we could deliver the most value to our clients that we get to work with. And optometry was our bet and it's been so damn worth it. Yeah. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit about where virtual people can fit in in an optometry clinic. Um when you're hiring people, because you, it sounds like you've been doing this in the optometry space, you you know are hiring dozens and dozens of new people every single month, incorporating them into practices. What are some of the um, entry level, meaning when an optometrist comes to you, they're like, hey, let's try this out, because that's the fear, right? It's like, is this going to work for me? Where do people usually start? when they're coming to team and saying, Hey, I want to try this out. So there's four general, four general areas um, that people generally come to us asking It is inbound phone calls. So that's new and existing patients. I can't, you know, I don't have the staff to pick up all my phone calls. The reason this one's so common is about 29% of all phone calls that are going to optometry practices right now during business hours are going unanswered. Number two, it's outbound phone calls. It's the confirmation calls. It's the overdue um, patient phone calls. It's all of the mundane work that sometimes gets left behind and then ruins the schedule 48 hours in advance because the confirmation calls weren't done mm -hmm. or the schedule, the holes in the schedule were not filled. Um, number three is insurance verification or light or early stage revenue cycle management work. But as we all know, 
checking online portals or calling insurance companies when we need to is so mundane, but so vital to yeah. having proper successful billing and proper patient care. Um, that would be number three. And then number four, which is unique to optometry is virtual scribing. Yeah. Yeah. So Corey, um, you know, if somebody is like, this is a crazy idea, you know, I don't know if my phone system would work to do that. You know, you've dealt with it all. Like how, how let's talk technology for a second. How does that work? Right. How do I get somebody who's in Brazil to pick up my phone and answer it when it rings in my office? How, like that, that just seems crazy. And that's just logistically in people's minds. They're like, well, I don't know how to do that. So I wouldn't even be able to do it. Part of the value that we bring here, Dave, is that we help people with these setups. So we'll work in conjunction with your IT company. It's a whole new world. Just like yeah. it was a whole new world for me two and a half years ago. Yeah. And so it's, it's about how do we guide and mentor through that process. If you have a VoIP phone company, um, you'll be able to virtually set up team members where they'll work off your system. If you have a landline or older, maybe Comcast or Spectrum, um, we can help set up a virtual solution to work there. It's still yours at the end of the day, but our guidance part of the process and the reason we have an account manager who works with you is so that as you have those questions or have those obstacles, we've watched hundreds of practices do it really successfully and mm -hmm. some not successfully. So how do we guide and mentor through those times to make it as seamless as a successful setup as possible? Yeah. So I'll speak to that because when, when I started working with team and I'll just in full disclosure, I, I am a customer of team. I have already worked with several other companies before coming to team. And so granted, some of these things were already worked out when I came to be with you because I had to figure them out. But when we first started working with virtual people, I remember my office lead was spending, she probably put in about 40 hours figuring out how do I get these people that Dr. Dave told me I have to hire to answer the phone. Like I got to figure that out. And she spent hours and hours figuring out this technology and the company that had hired these virtual people for us was kind of just there and being like, well, let us know when you want them to pick up the phone, right? And that is a huge obstacle and not everybody's going to go through what my office lead did uh, because not everybody's a slave driver like I am, like get these people answering <laughs> the phone, right? <laughs> so it, uh, when we came to you, some of that had been figured out. It's still a little bit clunky. You've helped us with that. But um is it so you you said that you're hiring people but also you've got an account manager let's start with that like let's start maybe maybe back up a little bit somebody comes to you and they're like hey we want to hire a virtual person walk me through the conversation you're going to have with me as an office uh start to finish where that person is starting to answer the phone or scribe for me what is that week? Is it, is it a week? Is it three weeks? Is it a month? What does this process look like, Corey? So before we even start, when someone comes to us to hire a additional team member that we want to go to the core, not, Hey, why do you need to hire? What's the problems that you're facing within your business? Mm -hmm. And we want to make sure that a virtual team member could come in and fulfill that need. Well, we don't want to put these hardworking individuals were in a practice in a situation where we know there's a high chance of chance of implosion. Mm -hmm. um, so it's much more of a consultative process to us because there's real humans on every side involved here. This is not a software we can stick in and take out in 30 yeah. days. So I have to just interrupt you. What I love about this is in working with you, you really, really value these people that you hire for me right? You, you and I have talked about this at how other companies that I've worked with for, for those companies, it's just a paycheck for the, uh, them. And then they find somebody to fill in, but you, you, you're kind of wanting to protect these employees that are in these other com countries and make sure they're taken care of so that they stick with you for a year or two or three. 
Uh, and so that's an important part is like, let's make sure we find out who the right person is and do you really need somebody? That's, that's a key component. And I'll share, this is a total <clears throat> deviation, um, from, from our subject, but something that as an entrepreneur or a business person, I'm really passionate about is something called shareholder capitalism. And what that means is there's three parties who have to win for a business to be sustainable in the long term, And that means the business needs to be profitable. Number one, number two, it means it needs to have happy and retained customers. And number three, it needs to have happy and retained employees. And unless all three of those are done in a generally equally yoked manner, the business, in my opinion, is not sustainable in the long term. And so right. we're not just running a charity case. Like we deeply value our team members, but at the same time, if our team members don't feel healthily paid, paid on time, respected as a co-equal to anyone in the world, then they eventually run out on the job. And that means you get lower performance as part of your company. And that means they attrit at higher rates. And so we want people where we pay damn well and that we treat them like human beings and we listen to their concerns and we continue to evolve because that means we have people knocking on our door to work with us. And we can, something we talk about internally all the time is we want to be the hiring or the Harvard of hiring where we, Harvard every year gets to be so picky that there's probably three or 5%. I don't actually know the num the real number on the number of applicants. It's not the, you know, McDonald's where you're pulling through and they're like text three, thrive five, five and start your job for $18 and 50 cents today. <laughs> And so if we create a demand instead of a begging atmosphere where they come in and they know that they're not only getting good pay, but they're being developed, I believe we deliver the best work and we create the yeah. most sustainable company, a total side rant, but I've been in business. I've done this for almost eight years now, and I've been misguided or lopsided at certain times where the businesses as I were running lost money. And guess what? You can't continue to run them. If they lose no. money or you didn't value your employees or your customer solution wasn't what it should have been. And those are the worst situations to be in. Yeah. So y you've told me this before, but you're, you're hiring people in the top percentage of wherever they live, right? Is, is that, is that top 30% or something like what is it usually from a pay perspective that they maybe, you know, is it, are you just paying them bottom dollar or do you guys, you've told me that before. So just as an example, um, in Brazil, our base wage, like our, our minimum wage puts you in the top 20% of earners. Wow. And so, you know, every country that number slightly varies, but it's how do we hire that, you know, top 10, 15, 25% where we can right. hire someone very capable where this we truly know can be a career and not just asking them to make a career commit. Yeah. And so if they, if they are doing something above and beyond and they've been trained a while and they get paid a little bit more, they're even in the, in the higher percentage than the top 20%. Okay. Sorry. I got you off on a rant. That was my fault <laughs> on, on that. Go back to uh, how do we get this person in? You've interviewed the office, made sure they're they're a good fit for having a virtual person, and you figured out what they need. Um, so once we sign an agreement to move forward, whether it's one, two, three, what whatever the number of hires is, and I would say I recommend a practice starting with one because it's a learning process during. I disagree with you. Oh, you you're two at the same time. I never will uh, hire one, and I never recommend anybody hire one. I know that conservatively, that's smart of you to say that. <laughs> I always recommend you hire at least two, and the reason why is the greatest burden on an office in the hiring process is the training, and if you're scared that this is going to not work out for you... Uh, find enough things that two people can do, hire two of them. Worst case scenario, one doesn't work out. We haven't had that issue with team. We've had it with other virtual people, the other virtual places we've worked with, but it didn't work out. And then we hired somebody, we trained them for two months and then it didn't work out. So I always like to hire two. And then if somebody doesn't work out, 
or we end up hiring another person, then one or those two people is now the trainer of the next one. And so my recommendation is different than yours, Corey. Yours is a good one as the as the owner of the business. It obviously shows you're 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 conservative in it, but is to always hire two. Hey, and you're the one who actually hires and trains them. So I'm I'm gonna go off your opinion here. Um from there, we tee them up with the account manager. We get really nitty gritty on, do we want them to be bilingual in English and Spanish? What hours do we want them working? What skill sets do we want them to come? Because someone who's really good at answering new patient phone calls is not your best insurance verifier. Those are two different personalities and skill strengths. Once we know what the goal is, what we're solving for here, what personality we're looking for, then we go recruit. What we don't want to do is say, Oh, Dr. Dave, you need a virtual assistant. Let me bring out of our uh, show showroom here three people who could possibly be good. But the problem with that is you're throwing mud on the wall. Mm -hmm. So then we go through that interview process. That interview process generally is five business days after your kickoff call. If one of those three to five candidates are good for the hiring manager, the owner of the business, then we begin the process and get them hired to start day one for the company. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and, and so really from an initial phone call, it could be two to four weeks before that person starts. And, uh, I'll say that may be a little longer than other places that I have in that I've, uh, other virtual places that I've worked with, but the caliber of the three or however many applicants that you give me to interview is is a lot higher. So I think you guys spend a little bit longer going and looking. Whereas I think with those other companies that I worked with, what they did is they just were like, hey, who wants to be a virtual scribe? Okay, great. Have you ever done it? They don't even ask if they've done it before or if they have any experience or if they're willing to learn. It's just they throw them at me. And then I'm like, do I like this person? And really mostly do I like their English is kind of usually what I'm asking. It ends up with the ca applicants that we've had with you. They've been a little bit higher caliber. And now we've got a struggle of which ones to hire as opposed to, do we want to hire one of these people? So that, that I think that's a good thing that it takes a little bit longer. Good things come to those who wait and it's not a long time. Um, but uh, it also helps that onboarding process. You know, and so it's a very good call out that's real compared to competitors. We do not bring interviews as quick. A goal for us in 2024 is to begin to speed up that process. What we wanted to do is, number one, quality is something we can't compromise on. Once we can prove that process, how do we begin to shrink the time? Because most people, to be candid, who are coming for us or coming to us are in a current need. And yeah. so I, I actually very much agree with your sentiment of, Quality is number one, and then timely, timeliness is number two, or speed to action. And that's something we're actually working on. Just a fun yeah. tidbit. Yeah. So usually my team actually handles this, my in-office. I have now designated one of our team members as the manager of our virtual team. Um, and she's kind of in charge of the phone calling, the insurance verification, and the billing. We actually have our virtual team do some of the billing. Um, and so she manages like five or six people. We've got 10 to 12 virtual people that are working with us at any one time. But recently, I myself wanted a new marketing person. And uh, so I came to you guys, right? So most of people are thinking about team for those four things that you mentioned, the inbound, the outbound, the insurance or the scribing, but you're happy to find people for other things, which is really impressive. So I managed that process. And what I thought was really interesting is you had Nate get a hold of me and Nate called me up like a half hour after I called you and, 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 and or emailed you guys and said, Hey, I want a marketing person. And he grilled me on questions that I didn't even think about for what this person was going to do. And that was before he even posted the job so that he could go out and find people. And the, the marketing experience that those applicants had when I interviewed them was pretty impressive. And so I think that goes to having that timeline being a little bit longer and that's okay. Um, 
So I think people just need to have a little bit of a patience. I think I think we're going to see a big explosion in virtual in 2024. Uh, I think you're probably ready for that, but you're starting to see this wave starting to happen in the United States, but also within healthcare. Is that something you guys are ready and poised for, or uh, is it? Ner- are you are you nervous? Um, we anticipate it. Number yeah. one. I would say we're already seeing the ground swells of movement, especially within optometry where people are hiring. And uh, number number three for me is just continuing to replicate and improve our quality as we scale. Because it's one thing to run a individual restaurant and every meal is darn good. As we continue to grow our team and grow our infrastructure, can we do it bigger and better and not just at the same quality? So it's an exciting mm-hmm. time. I mean, as an entrepreneur, these are the... Uh, gold rushes that you live for where you've found product market fit and now it's continuing to scale it and make it better. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think so too. Um, so, uh, I, I guess the, the next kind of question that people have is how expensive is this? And we don't need to talk direct prices unless you want to, but you know, I'm paying people like, and I'm high in Seattle, but it's difficult for me to hire anybody for less than 18 or $20 an hour. Add on top of that, all of my taxes, all of the insurances and all of those sort of things. Really, most employees are costing me 25 to $30 an hour. Is, um, is, is the arena of the virtual space considerably less, partially less? Like what are some of the, the economic aspects for the practice? Yeah, really good question. So our pricing comes out, we charge a flat monthly fee, whether it's full-time or part-time. Um, well, depending on whether it's full-time or part-time, that fee fluctuates. Um, but our average hourly comes out to a little over $11. I think it's about $11.50 an mm-hmm. hour. And the nice part about that is it covers the whole kit and caboodle of costs where, you know, payroll tax adds in all of the unemployment taxes and healthcare. Um, So that's where we land for a full-time hired team member. We're $1,850 per month. Okay. Okay. And so, you know, what kind of hours is that like a 20, 30 hour is that, or is that a full-time mostly 40 hours, 40 hours a week? Okay. Yep. And what we look at is eight full working hours a day. And then for part-time, obviously it's just 925 a month. Yeah. Corey, you know, I don't know if I could figure out, this is this, I'm, I'm asking this question for, for somebody else is, Corey, I don't know if I can figure out 40 hours worth of work for somebody to do. You got to hear that question all the time, mm-hmm. right? And uh, how do you, how do you respond to that? I have my own response, but I was curious what you think. Um. I mean, I probably will give the conservative response out of our our tandem here. That's a great place for people to start part-time. I actually think the bigger reason people struggle to find the work is they're just, they're afraid to let go. It's different to hand a piece of paper to someone in the office. Now, once you've gained the trust and rapport, then it's like, oh, if I can do this, they can do that. And if they can do that, then can they do this? And it's the snowball effect. And that's why some of our customers start part-time and then grow their way into a multi-person relationship. But I'm also very intrigued to hear what you think. No, I think you're right. I do think that you're right. And I think that it also is one of those things where you need to be looking for opportunities to raise your level of service to patients. One of those could be is you've got a person who got referred to your office or you see a new patient. What an opportunity for you to go in to that new patient's account before they come into the office and call and get the prior records so that the doctor can review them. What about reaching out to the patient and saying, hey, you know, we've got this questionnaire. I can fill that out over the phone with you, or we could have, I could send it to you over an email. But rather than just getting a text message, if you get that personalized phone call, if you get a phone call after the appointment, hey, would you mind filling out a review? Um, We really enjoyed having you in the office and touching base with them on that. 
there's marketing opportunities, right? Utilizing artificial intelligence to be able to help with some marketing programs and having somebody who, you know, maybe you're in between patients and you've got an hour, right? That person could go and help write a newsletter for your patients. They could use, you could tell them what you want it to say. They could go to artificial intelligence. They could do some editing with Grammarly, um, Quillbot, whatever it may be, and then send something back to you. You quick read over it. Another thing is that we do not send letters to primary care providers nearly to the degree that we should. Maybe we do it for diabetic patients, but what about other patients who have systemic diseases? So your patient came in, they have diabetes. What a great opportunity for you to have a base letter for you to go in and say to your virtual person, hey, would you mind going and doing that letter filling? And then you tell them what you want filled in on it. They write the letter for you. You get back from lunch. You've got three letters to look over and boom, those, the, then the virtual person either faxes it or emails it to the primary care provider or can print it off into the office and somebody in the office can put it in the mail, send it out. So the writing of the letters is a really, really big one that can be done. Um, so there are things that we don't currently do that we should be doing because we don't have time for it. And our current in-office staff, because we're mostly understaffed, is never going to be able to take on those duties. Uh, but if it could be done on a computer, it can be done by somebody virtually. And so what what are what are being what is being done in the office? that is not on a computer. Well, you do need somebody to walk around the office physically to, you know, do the equipment, to take the retinal photos and whatnot. But once that person gets into the exam room and once that person has passed that person off to the doctor, then a virtual scribe can get everything entered into the computer, can do all of the coding, can do all of the uh, the charting, can do all the letter writing, can do the, the, the recap of everything, can send the patient text messages, can order their contact lenses, can call up the contact lens laboratory and order the contact lenses. Um, the list of things is endless of how we can take things to the next level when we have somebody who can partner with us in that. Uh, those I are just a couple of think. my... <laughs> well, no, it's it's very true where you're looking at a business from where have we developed holes in our business that we couldn't fill because of the cost of staff before. You eventually have to say when push comes to shove, I, you know, because doctors have to take home money. It, yep. This is not a charity case. This is what the staff can do. But you're, when your cost of labor is one third or one half, it's how do we go to the next level, which just makes you a m magnet for marketing going forward. Yeah. Because patients say this is different. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I, um, I just was on an airplane recently and I'm showing Corey this. This is my list of duties that my virtual team could do or is currently doing is how do we make this even better? Um, you know, with the billing, insurance credentialing, you know, verification online, communicating over G chat, texting, emailing, phone systems, develop who develop person people in office who are really good at training so that they can then further train other staff members as they come in, developing standard operating procedures so that when somebody else comes in, we have a document on how to do things. Um, and, you know, I think one of the other key components that I just wanted to talk with you a little bit about, Corey, is how do you make these people that are in another country part of your team, right? I, I think what I've observed is that offices who don't do well with virtual staff, it's because they see them as a software, right? You, you've probably dealt with that. How, how do you see that occurring in offices? So it's actually even part of our consultative approach going back to that. There's certain people call in and just say, hey, I need three people to do some really busy work and they just need to, they can't take holidays. And what happens if they're sick? Like, do they still work with their, and very early on, you can tell someone doesn't value them as a human being. Mm. And the biggest thing that it takes to be successful in integrating a remote team is just treating someone like a co-equal. They're no different yeah. than we are. They are dedicated to the job. And then 
inviting them and treating them like an in-office team member. When you do your morning huddle, have them join from a Google Meet or a Zoom link. Yep. And when you do your office holiday party, have them dress up and have a background. And when it's their birthday, send out a message to the total office. It is the little things, but nothing at the end of the day, none of those um, bells and whistles changes the feeling that they're a co-equal. Because when you look at Latin America and the Philippines and India, they are so used to a corporation coming in like Deloitte or Accenture and hiring 100,000 people and for them just to be a number. Mm. Where they crave to be different is to be a human. And that's what's yeah. so excited, exciting for them, not about just the pay that comes with these opportunities, but to work with people and to make an impact and not just to put push paper and to follow policy. And yeah. uh, when when people break it down that simple, it goes monumentally far. Yeah, yeah. I it was uh, I was sent a picture by one of my virtual managers, uh, and and she sent me a picture of the meeting that took place on Halloween, and it had all of the team members uh, wearing their costumes with you know weird backgrounds, and they were all dressed up, ready for the day, and they. Uh, they had just they had just developed that they're a team of people. They're not just like these individuals who are checking insurance. And, you know, the more you can get the individuals that you're working with virtually to be integrated with the office, the better it will be for the office and it'll better be for them, just like you bring up. Um, and and I think that is a key component. Um, finding ways that you can bless them, right? Like figuring out when their birthdays are. You know, there's holidays that happen other parts of the of other parts of the world that don't happen here. And if you can find a way to make that holiday important for them, I recently had a a team member who was in the Philippines. She uh, had a brain had to have brain surgery, right? So how do we help support her? Because she doesn't have health insurance. Um, and how do we find her? But she's been working for me for 10 years. So she's, you know, my friend, you know? And so realizing that these are real people, getting to know them, talking with them about what's happening in their real life, you know, it all it takes is like two to five minutes a day in between patients where you're having conversations and those things happen organically, just realizing they're not just a number. So, you know, I think in closing, Corey, um, uh, let's talk a little bit about uh, about what differentiates Team from some of the other virtual companies that are out there. This is you're like the 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 virtual guy, right? You know more about this than maybe anybody out there. But there's something that you had to do to differentiate team and uh, that from some of the others. So why might it be more beneficial to work with you than some of the other companies that are out there? Yeah, really good question. Number one, it's the people. And uh, what I mean by that is it's the quality of people that we can find. So we exclusively or predominantly um, hire out of Latin America. Why that matters is you can get people who are bilingual in Spanish and English, um, which makes a very big difference with the growing Spanish speaking population within the United States. Number two, the benefit of that is Latin America's the same time zone. So outsourcing is very common in the Philippines and in India and in Pakistan. But the problem is that's the middle of the night. And so it's harder to retain team members if you're working from 1130 p.m. to 730 a.m. every single True. day. Yep. Um, number two, it's our relationship with Brigham Young University, knowing that someone can go through four years of coursework as a dedicated individual at a standard that we know. When we see a random university, and I'm not saying anything bad or good, I just don't know the quality. But mm -hmm. I went to BYU myself. It's seen as a top 25 university within the United States. And so we know the quality that's coming out of it when someone graduates. And also, it shows that they're they're dedicated and engaged, but they're understanding or beginning to understand integration into American culture. We are unique as Americans about time and how we hold our meetings and how we interact with each other. And we're used to that because that's all we see every single day. Um, but when you hire a virtual team from another part of the globe, that's an adjustment phase. And so we've found that adjustment phase to be much easier 
um, when they've already integrated it into American culture. Number three, and specific to optometry, is this is home for us. It's not just about providing virtual team members, but it's understanding HIPAA compliance. And it's understanding how our account managers can integrate your team member into your virtual soft phone with Weave to make that process more simple. Or when you come and say, hey, you know, Jose is doing three insurance verifications an hour, they know that's a standard they should be at or shouldn't be at. And so it allows us to relate and connect better and hold people accountable to higher standards because we're really working not to be a provider of people, but to be industry experts on how to integrate those people in and maximize value on both sides. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So true. Well, uh, I think this is a really good opportunity for people, uh, hopefully people that are listening, uh, get an opportunity to look into how a virtual team of people can help uh, elevate their practice and uh, go to another level. I think the the caliber of the people that you're bringing to uh, to an interview is is spectacular, but I think it's beyond that. It's the account manager, uh, right? And uh, I I personally knew my account manager before she joined Team, so it's been really cool to see her uh, come on board and and help. But uh, she's just looking out to make sure everybody's working well. She sent me several emails after we'd hire somebody and be like, how, how are they doing? Or there was an issue with um, some hours that were reported. And so, you know, I don't have to deal with those, like having having my, my team of uh, managers deal with it. You know, team has been really, really helpful with that. And so I appreciate you coming on and sharing your perspectives. It's been uh, awesome chatting with you, my man. Hey, I appreciate the time. All right. And thank you for joining us for this episode. Make sure to like and subscribe. Stay tuned for future episodes. I want to again thanks Team for their support of this particular podcast. Uh, they have been a great supporter of the myopia community, helping to uh, make clinicians and offices run better, whether it's calling and scheduling appointments, whether it's answering the phone, helping with billing issues, scribing in the exam room, whatnot. Having a virtual team member in your practice is a real real show stopper. So with that, I want to thank team again for their support. Check them out at hireteam.com. That's H-I-R-E-T-E-M.com or click the notes in the show description below. Thanks again to team. One, two, three, four. Thank you for tuning in to the Myopia podcast. If you enjoy our content, please leave a five-star review and don't forget to subscribe for more great episodes. 